What's up guys, part two of everything that I've learned in a decade of entrepreneurship. If you haven't watched part one, I highly suggest you check it out as well as the article over at revolutionarylifestyledesign.com because there's a lot of content and you check out the article too, you're not gonna have to take notes. Um, as I said in part one, I've started like six businesses. I've made six figures both as a pro trader and in corporate sales. I've had some success and I've also had a ton of failures and basically made a lot of mistakes and my goal in this series is to make sure that you don't make the same mistakes that I do. Let me have made all the mistakes for you so that you know what not to do and instead I want to be able to take a decade off your learning curve by giving you a decade of what I learned as well as help you avoid the 90% failure rate of most businesses. Again, this advice is for you know, your average 18 to 35 year old guy who's either, you know, this is, I wanna get you out of the rat race up to six figures in a business. After six figures, I mean, you can go on and do what you wanna do. Or if you already have a business and it's and it's just getting started, I wanna be able to get you up to speed with, with what I know. Um, the majority of this advice is not for guys trying to build a $40 million to $100 million tech startup or a startup. I don't know how to do that. Uh, you're gonna have to look somewhere else for that. But I, I have, I did try my hand at a tech startup. So some of what I'm covering is um, startup stuff. And so if you are that exceptional guy with 150 IQ and you're the rock star programmer, you might be able to find some use in that. Okay. So in part one, we covered what to expect. We covered what not to do. We covered how to get started. And now in part two, I'm gonna cover getting and keeping clients uh, or customers, um, how to get investment or what you need to know about investment or not having to worry about investment, and then how to, get, how to handle obstacles. So without further ado, getting and keeping clients and customers. Number one priority, protect your brand first, okay? This, this is counterintuitive to what a lot of people might say about you know, getting money first. Money is important, money is extremely important when it comes to business, but your brand is more important, okay? I'll tell you what, no brand means no business, all right? Um, again, I told you that I'm a big fan of not being a hustler, but building a brand, creating a vision, creating something that's gonna be paying you for the next 25 years or 30 years, maybe something you can give to your kids. And it's so much more exciting when you're building a brand and, and trying to build something great as opposed to just one hustle here, one hustle there. And building the brand means protecting that brand first, okay? There's a lot of stuff I could do on RLD on my website to optimize. I could have pop-ups all over the place. I could spam you all kinds of stuff for affiliate marketing on the newsletter. I could do all kinds of things, but instead I don't do that because in my niece of self-improvement, there are so many people that aren't ethical or that are, you know, don't have the right mindset that I need to protect my brand so that you don't think that I fall into that area. It's very, very important for me to differentiate myself from that by not doing dirty stuff or promoting courses that aren't good or spamming your newsletter or all these types of things. Very, very important. Okay. You got to protect your brand. The first thing you do is protect your there's two things you do to protect your brand. The first thing you need to do is protect your assets, okay? So if you've got a website, get Securi, S-U-C-U-R-I, on your website to protect it um, from being hacked. If you, uh, you know, if business insurance is right for your business, then get that. Uh, use LastPass to protect all your passwords, you know, in case you lose your computer at a, a cafe or something, uh, all your passwords are protected. Um, make sure your computer is locked and, and pin protected every time, you know, if you get up to go to the washroom, I always shut my computer just in case it gets stolen. I don't care if the computer gets stolen. I care if my information gets stolen and, and people have access to my passwords. It's very, very important that that doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, last year my site got hacked and it was sending customers to spam sites, uh, really not fun. I was really shook up over it, but I got security in there. And within an hour, they got rid of all, ma all the malware. And then I put on like insane level protections and you know whitelist my IP and all kinds of layers to log in. And it's kind of a pain in the ass to log into my site, but it's totally worth it because I know that it's very well protected now and that I'm not going to get hacked again, God willing. Um, 
So definitely protect your, your brand first, protect your assets first, whatever type of assets you have. Maybe you have more assets that need to be protected than I do, but make sure those are all protected because, okay, you know, if they're not protected, then, then you don't have a business, right? You don't have a business when your website's hacked. The other thing you need to do that's super, super important to protect your brand is to be ethical, okay? Uh, in today's online age, it, it only takes some negative feedback to, to ruin your reputation, right? You know, if you're some kind of scumbag, well, someone's going to find out and do an expose. And then when people Google your name, it's going to be like, hey, John Smith did all these things, right? And now you've lost a ton of potential clients, if not, you know, your business, because people think that you're a con man. Um, and it might not happen today. You might be able to get away with it today or tomorrow, but it will. You will eventually get caught or, or you know, something will happen. And not only that, but in the time between now and when it, you know, it, it hits the fan, you're going to be living and sleeping uh, you're in fear of being, you know, subconsciously going to be there of like, I'm dirty. I hope I don't get caught. And every day you're trying to like manage not getting caught and, you know, all this stuff. Like if you look at Jordan Belfort from Wolf of Wall Street, that guy had to do hardcore drugs every day because he hated himself so much and he I'm sure was worried a bit about getting caught by the regulators all the time because he was just scamming people out of money and you know like living in fear every day of getting caught and oh god the client you know the client called back okay what lie do I have to tell them okay they called onto that lie what other lie do I have to tell like that's a really good way to be unhappy doing that um and, and that's it's not just about getting caught like you know, Jordan Belfort gets caught, he loses all his money, he can't work in securities industry, he goes to jail. I mean, all those types of things can happen. But not only that, being unethical just takes the fun out of the business, okay? At the end of the day, everything I talk about in self-improvement comes down to creating a happier quality of life, including building a business. And you can't be happy when you're a scumbag, okay? Anybody who's scamming someone out of money is not a happy person. Happy per people don't act like that. Happy people have empathy for other people like there's another human being there um, I don't want to scam money from that person because then I'm gonna feel bad about myself I'm gonna feel guilty um, and even if those guys think they don't feel guilty your subconscious keeps track of everything and it's gonna come out in self-hatred and that's why those guys like Jordan Belfort are, are having to do these drugs to get a synthetic feeling of feeling good because they don't feel good about themselves because they're con men okay so Instead, focus on your business like it's your purpose in life, you're, like you're building this great vision and your purpose in life is to create happier realities. It's to solve problems for your clients. It's to solve problems for your customers. It's to make their lives better. It's to get good feedback from them after you've given them something. Like my favorite thing to do is, is read the YouTube comments. I mean, maybe 5% of them are negative, but the other 95% are mostly positive. And then I wake up and I'm like, man, I help, I help some guy in Japan or I help some guy over here. And the YouTube videos are for free, for free. And I, don't, I don't care that I'm not making money on that. I, I, I'm just happy that like, oh man, someone likes my stuff and, and I'm helping someone's life be better. It took me until I was like 30 to figure that out of like, man, helping other people is a really good way to be happy. Um, I know that might sound a little bit cheesy and if, if, if I was 25, I'd be like, man, fuck, fuck that shit. I just want to get paid. But like, it, it really, really does affect you and, um, helping people achieve their goals and solving your client's problem is its own reward in itself. Okay. It's, it's just another reward besides the money that you're getting. So those are the two key points on protecting your brand. The next thing you need to do in regards to getting clients and customers is make revenue priority number two and priority number three. Okay, so we got the protect your brand out of the way. All right. With that said, I'm no martyr. I'm no self-sacrificing martyr. I would not be talking to you guys if this wasn't about money. Um, this business took three years for me to be profitable. I never would have done that if I didn't think that investing all this time and money was going to pay off. It's start. It's paying off now. And it's only going to pay off more in the future, um, God willing. So like, you know, you have to have money as a major, major, major priority because otherwise you're going to have to work a job. I mean, you need to make money. You need to make revenue. You need to have it as a major focus. And it's just because Twitter hasn't turned a profit and YouTube hadn't turned a profit in 10 years of existence um, doesn't mean that you can afford to run a business like that. Okay. 
that YouTube could literally afford to burn a room full of money because they have so much, but you can't afford to lose even five grand probably or 10 grand. Maybe you could, but it's gonna stink, um, especially when you're getting started, okay? So you need revenue, 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 revenue. Something I really, really learned well in corporate sales and I'm grateful for the experience even though I hated it, it's like every month was a revenue target. Every month was a revenue target. And it just beat all the delusional expectations I had out of my head. It beat everything out. And it was like, you know, some of the guys I worked for I didn't like, but I'll give them the respect in terms of those guys knew how to get revenue and they knew how to get me to get revenue. And, you know, I saw how important it is to have that revenue target every month. Revenue, 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 revenue. Okay. You know, very, very important, um, which means to get revenue, you need to know what Grant Cardone says, who has my money? Who has my money? How do I sell them? Okay. I know who has my money. Every single man, 18 to 35 could benefit from my personal improvement business. How do I, how do I sell to them? Well, I put out 99% free content on YouTube, Facebook, SoundCloud, iTunes, RevolutionaryLifestyleDesign.com in the hopes that they see me as an authority, in the hopes that they, um, I'm able to solve a lot of their problems for free, and then in the hopes that that is going to translate into them wanting to pay to solve uh, a major problem and buy one of my books. And ideally, they're going to like that book and keep buying every product that I have and are going to be a lifetime customer. That's who has my money. If you're in real estate, okay, well, where are you? Let's say you're where I came from in Toronto. You're going to specialize in downtown, you know, Bay Street real estate. Okay, so you're going after uh, C-suite executives. You're going after guys who make two hundred thousand dollars a year. You're focusing on your niche. However, many miles is your niche? You're looking at who the top five real estate salesmen are in in your niche, and now you know who you're competing with. You know, you're getting all. You're finding them through listings, you're finding them through, you know, wherever, wherever it is, you know where, you you have to know who has your money, where to find them, and go after them, okay? And it means you need to know how to sell. Again, check out my book, How to Sell, to see exactly how to do that. And then you need to know how to keep those customers or clients, very important. Um, so start with revenue and how you're going to get it. You don't need a fancy business plan because you're not reinventing the wheel. You, you already know that your product has a service or demand like I covered in part one, okay? You already know that people are successful in it and you just need to know what they're doing. You need to model their success. You need to read all the books about, you know, selling real estate or whatever it is and know who has your money and how you're gonna get it, all right? And when you're getting it, you gotta set those revenue targets every month. Just like I did in corporate sales, I set revenue targets Every month for RLD, I set it every year, and I take that really seriously. Okay, if I missed a revenue target by like 20%, I gotta, okay, stop everything. Let's let's go and see what happened here, okay? And if my revenue's steadily increasing or, or there's a big spike in it, I'll be like, okay, what happened here? What, what did I do right here? How do I do more of that? Very important. And again, you can see it in my book, How to Sell, but you can also check out the, my definitive guide to sales. It's a four part series where you can get a lot of good information for free. Um, part two is on how to sell. Part two is, and part three is on how to service your customers and clients. You can find that on YouTube. You can find that on my website. Um, unfortunately, that's the scope of that is so big. I don't have time to go into that right now, but you don't even have to buy the book. You can find like a good amount of that material for free on, on my site or on YouTube. So that's very important. Set those revenue targets and be on it, man. Stay on that revenue, okay? If you're not serious about revenue, I mean, you're not serious about your business and you're not gonna make it. Next point, getting and keeping clients and customers. So advertising, and I'm talking about online advertising like Facebook and Google AdWords does not pay for one-off products that cost less than $100. So let me explain. We found this out in my tech startup where by the time we got to market, we figured out it took $60 in Google AdWords to get a customer, but our product was $60. Actually, when I came on board, the product was $30 and they were losing money on advertising. So I said, build a product up to $60, 
Now it's breaking even and that was it. We tried to sell it at $90, people weren't buying it. So it was like $60 breaking even on advertising. And in RLD, I don't advertise my products because my books are $40 and it, the advertising won't pay for it, okay? In the future when I do courses, I might do $100 or $200 courses, I'll probably advertise those, especially if they're SEO targeted keywords like um, how to get built or how to get laid or something like that that has natural search volume, then I, I might advertise that because I know it already, that, that, that keyword sells, okay? Uh, but compare that to my man in Toronto, one of my oldest friends who made 40, 40 grand in his first year as a, a car broker where he would basically negotiate a discount for you and he would take 20% of whatever he saved you off the sticker price of a car, which I think is a really good business model, by the way. And his only expense, he wasn't doing any call, cold calls. He was only doing inbound Google advertising and he was spending $500 a month doing that. And that got him $40,000 a year in revenue, just $500 a month in, in advertising spend because his average transaction, his average deal was $700. So literally one deal would pay for his entire advertising. You know, he closed five deals a month. So that amount of advertising was super, super useful for him. Okay. Because there was enough money in his deal volume. If this is not a, you know, it's not a hundred percent guarantee. Like maybe, you know, okay, if you have an $80 product, you might be able to make the AdWords work for you. But in my experience, it's gotta be a hundred dollars or over, you know, ideally if it's a one-off product, $200 or more, $300, $400, that kind of a range. Um, because you need something that's going to pay off because advertising costs money, right? You know, $5 product advertising that, I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to happen, you know? Um, so if you're planning on advertising on Google or Facebook, uh, the, the exception to it is like this, okay? I'm just talking about one-off products there. If you've got a recurring product, like say supplements or whatever, and you know, each customer buys, the average customer will buy $50 of supplements at a time off your business, and the average customer is gonna come back and buy that every month for six months, one year, three years. Again, you have to learn the, the life cycle of your business really well. And you can test it out. You can afford to gamble on that because even if you take a loss on the first month, uh, you, you know you're only taking a loss in month one, but by, by month two, that customer that you spent uh, $100 to get in, who only spent $60, is gonna spend another $60, then you made money, and then six months, a year from now, you know, you're continuing, continuing to make money on that particular customer. Um, so a recurring product is definitely you can definitely afford to break even or lose money on that, but for a one-off product, it just doesn't work. And the other thing that can work really well if for, um, it is a monthly subscription, right? That in a monthly subscription, you can afford to lose money or you can afford to break even because you know that the guy's gonna be there for, you know, he's got a recurring bill on his credit card that's usually gonna last three months to a year or maybe you know, some clients are gonna be there for five years. So you can actually afford to lose a decent amount of money on advertising um, for that particular customer or client. But on average, if you're just doing like a one-off product, if you're doing eBooks, um, if you're not taking my advice and doing a service-based business, you're, you, you want it to do e-commerce, e advertising might not work for you if it's just a one-off product. So that's something that's very, very important to understand. Next point on getting and, and keeping customers is uh, do not bet on a deal until it's closed, right? This is something that I learned every single day in sales and I learned it so many times. I learned it in dating, uh, I learned it in my tech business, okay? You don't, that deal is not guaranteed until you have their money in your hand, okay? For my tech business, we had a verbal agreement for a, for a buyout from the fourth largest Canadian media company. And our business advisor said we were looking about three million for the three of us, which is gonna be about a million a piece before taxes. And then it's gonna be another year of golden handcuffs where I'd be making like 150 grand to help them transition it onto their team. And I was like, gonna be gone, I'm gonna be into Thailand. I was like, yeah, baby, can't wait, man. And I knew that like, okay, it's not, it's not closed, but I was like, the guy gave us, he's like, for sure we're in. 
Then he went back and talked to the, the top decision makers at the company and they ran the numbers internally again and they were out, say la vie, okay? Now you might say, hey Will, you weren't, you weren't talking to the decision maker, but the person who probably signed off or didn't sign off on that was either the CEO or the COO. We were talking to like the top, probably the you know number four, number five guy at the, camp, the company. The only guy we could get a, a meeting with, he had a relationship with my business partner, my business partner, or sorry, my business advisor. My business advisor had previously uh, taken another company and sold it to him. So we were talking to the, you know, the best, the absolute best guy that we could get a, we could get a hold of. But again, you know, a lot of times things don't work out like that. All right. Um, and so you don't have the money when a client has interest. Um, you don't have the money when they verbally agree. You don't even have the money when they come down to sign a contract. Okay. Like I was working in sales when I was working in corporate sales and 10% of clients don't pay. I learned that. And some of them are big companies. And some of them are just, they're just dicks and they're just like, well, sue me. They know that you're not going to get involved with a lawsuit. So even if they do sign the contract, it does not count until you have their money in your hand. So do not start to make all kinds of predictions um, and start to spend money. You're like, oh man, I'm, I got three verbal agreements from clients this week. That means I can spend a lot more money in this. No, wait till you have the money and wait till you see how many clients actually come through. Um, and this is another section where, or another area where it comes to doubling or tripling your efforts or like Grant Cardone says, 10 xing your efforts because even your most conservative estimates are probably not going to hit you, hit your targets. Okay. Like let's say first year in, 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 um, service-based business and you're trying to do by the end of the year, you're trying to get up to six grand a month, double or triple the amount of work you think you're going to have because the conversion rate is always going to be lower online than people tell you. Um, you're going to get way less clients than you think you're, you're, you're going to get clients fall out. You're going to get clients not pay. You're going to have refunds. You're going to get all, all kinds of things. So again, make sure that, that you don't bet on anything until it's closed and that you're super, you're super, um, uh, pragmatic about it. Almost not quite pessimistic. Like you have a super optimistic vision, but like I never get excited about it a deal or when I used to do deals until it was actually in my hand. I would just be like, well, they said it's, it's going to go down, but like, you know, let's not put too much weight on that. All right. So that is getting and keeping clients and customers. Again, there's a ton more and it's all about sales, how to sell, how to get customers. Again, you can check out my free series, definitive guide to sales. You can check out my book, how to sell on how to do that. So next point, this is the, uh, uh, second last, second last section is getting investment. Okay. Again, this applies primarily to exceptional guys who are trying to make it happen in a startup or guys who maybe aren't the 160 IQ rock stars, but you've got some other business where there might be um, investment involved like an e-commerce business uh, where you know you might want to sell your site. Um, but if you're doing what I said, uh, you're, you're, you're doing a service business, chances are no one's going to want to buy your personal trainer business because it's all based around you. You're not replaceable. Uh, but for, for guys who are exceptional, um, you know, this is stuff that I learned from dealing with venture capitalists in my tech business, and it would also apply somewhat to your e-commerce business. Okay. So the first thing you need to understand in getting investment is investors don't care about your business on, until you have traction. Um, that's something that took us six months to learn or because our accelerator, um, like I mentioned in part one. I didn't have a good experience at our accelerator. Our accelerator had us running around like retards selling our company to every single VC in Toronto. Um, and it took us six months of like going around to companies to where I finally sat down and we're, and we're just getting like no's and maybes. And I was like, what, what are you guys looking for? You know, what's the venture capitalist? What's the angel investor looking for? And, and the guy just told us, he's like, you know, we don't care about companies until they're doing 25 grand in revenue. I went to my man, Zach, I was like, dude, we just waited like six months, right? They don't care unless we're making 25 grand in revenue and growing, okay? They want to see what's called the hockey stick traction, which is like you're starting off slow, 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 you're growing, growing, and, and then they start to see a massive spike. So they want to get in when, when there's that massive spike. They're like, okay, you know, these guys are proven. 
the massive spike is coming and we got we want to get in just at the ground floor as they're blowing up and and just sort of like yeah boys we'll hop on board great work let us get in here now and when we're just doing over here they're like yeah we don't give a fuck about you because we have a lot of money everyone wants our money um and you know we have our pick right so they want to see they don't care about your dreams they don't care what you're, you're gonna do they want to see hard evidence first they have a ton of options um basically they want something for nothing. They want blue sky and no risk. And they can afford um, to do that because everyone wants their money. Uh, of course, there are exceptions. Businesses like Twitter and Facebook, where they, they were able to sell into investors without revenue. Um, but they were selling another form of traction, which was subscriber traction. Okay. So not revenue traction, but they were able to sell like Look at our user base. You know, we're, we've gone from a thousand users to ten thousand to hundred thousand to a million, and you know, if you're the next Snapchat, right? You can sell hockey stick traction on your subscriber base. Okay, it's not as exciting to a VC as revenue, but it it is. It's the next best thing, especially if they're seeing like a huge a huge um, hockey stick traction. Okay, but again, guys. For that type of business, I really think you've got to be that 160 IQ rockstar programmer. All right, I, I don't have any, I don't have any business being involved in in, in a tech startup because I'm just not smart enough. Next point is when you have when you have traction. This is the ironic thing: when you have traction, you don't need investors. Okay, you don't need them. But the ironic thing is, you know, if you have 25k a month in revenue and you've scaled up to that in a year, and you're scaling up quick with hockey stick traction, and the next month's gonna be 40K in revenue, uh, you don't need investors because you can fund your own marketing campaign. You can fund $30,000 a month and throw that into marketing and, and really blow it up. Um, you know, so <laughs> that's the funny thing. And so what it comes down to again is if you are doing the startup or you're looking to be in a business where you wanna sell it, maybe in e-commerce, comes back to what I said in getting and keeping clients, which is priority number two and three of getting revenue. When you have revenue, you have a business, you have money to fund your own marketing, you don't need investors, you don't need to beg investors to get them to buy in, buy you marketing. Um, and at that point, investors are gonna be coming to you. I mean, it's gonna be a really, really easy sell to get in a room with a bunch of VCs when you say, hey, we've been operational for six months and we've got 25, grand a month in traction and it's only growing or you know maybe your e-commerce store is doing 10 grand a month and and you know you want to sell it to some guy for 60 grand or whatever very easy to get that meeting but uh, I suggest if you're if you're doing a startup um, you get your money up before you even bother talking with investors I mean we spent so much time putting these deals together and, and putting pitches and putting prospectuses together and it was just a total waste of time what we should have done was just spent that six months just getting revenue up and not only would we have a way better chance of getting investors, but we could also not have investors and just do it all ourselves because the investors are gonna want a percentage. But also, if you do get investment, you have a way, way, way better um, bargaining chip. Like let's say, you know, the off chance you, you got investors when you don't have any revenue. Well, they're gonna want way more of your company, they're gonna want way more control, and they're gonna invest way less money than if you're coming at them with 25K a month in revenue. Now you have, now you're valuable. Now you're the hot girl, now they're chasing you. Now there's a bidding war, right? As opposed to like, please, please, please give us money, we don't have anything, please give us money, right? Then, the, you know, when you're the beggar, when, when you're the hot girl, it's like now you have all the money, you're like, well, no, um, you're not getting that much of our company and you actually have to get, get invest a lot more than you know what you want. And if you don't want it, that's okay. The venture capitalist next door, we can go over them because we've been talking with them too. All right, so that's something to understand. Last point on getting investment is get that government money, dude. Okay, in most Western companies, there are a ton of loans and grants for entrepreneurs, especially tech entrepreneurs. We had every one of them in Toronto. We got all of them, okay? Take advantage of it by getting as many grants and loans as you can get. Um, if it's a service-based business, you, you're probably not gonna be able to get too much, but you might be able to get some. I'm not sure, depending on where you are. But, uh, you know, get as many of those grants and loans. Um, I'm not talking about loans where you have to pay them back, okay? Like, a lot, I mean, get, get, the, get the grants. Okay, you can get like, you know, you might, for a tech business, you can get probably like 25, 30 grand because government 
wants tech businesses, right? So they'll, they'll happily give, give you a grant. You just have to be prepared to fill out a lot of paperwork. This is something that was actually helpful at the accelerator. They helped us with that stuff, but at the end of the day, you don't need the accelerator to do it. You just need to find, you need to find a list of all the grants in your province or your city or your state, go after all of them and really be serious about the paperwork and plan on waiting like six months to a year because dealing with the government is a nightmare to get, but I mean, you could get 30, 40 grand in free money that you don't have to pay back or, you know, all, all kinds of other things. So go get your, give me that if you can. Yet ache. Finally, we're coming to the last section, which is going to be handle, how to handle obstacles. And this is psychological. And this might be the most important thing of the whole series. Okay. Because... You know, it's like a prize fighter. Like they say, uh, a champion boxer is 90% psychological, 10% physical. And I feel like succeeding in business is 90% psychological, 10%, you know, all the other stuff, assuming you chose the right business. Um, the first thing to do in handling obstacles is, is, is don't quit, dude. Okay. I was reading some stats. It's like 50% of people quit after the first business that fails, 75% after the second, 90% after the third, and on average, 90% of all businesses fail. Okay, so the person who gets into that first business probably gonna fail because they're not watching my video and don't know to start the right business and they're all fucked up because they're reading entrepreneur porn or they're buying some fucking stupid Subway franchise and then they're done. Okay, and this, this, this is what it is. The people who power through failure get all the money. Okay, the 10% of guys who succeed in business are the guys who get rich. You get all the money. Everyone else has to go back to um, settling for mediocre jobs and settling for mediocre money and working for a company and getting the table scraps of what the owner decides to give them. Or the owner's making $10 million a month and he's like, here's your 40000 Because that owner just fucking powered through and didn't quit no matter what happened. It's that simple. So don't quit just because things get hard. Go into the right business. Don't quit. Persistence is the most important characteristic of an entrepreneur. No ifs, ands, or maybes. I still get emails from young guys for 21. Like, well, I've tried selling real estate or coaching. It's been two months. It's really hard. I was like, yeah, dude, talk to me in two years. What You thinking about pivoting or quitting already? Come on, man. You got to be serious. You got to be really, really, really persistent, 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 dude. Okay. Um, remember this. If you truly have the, the spirit of an entrepreneur, working a job for the rest of your life is not an option. I didn't have a choice about starting a business. I had to because I have to make money some way and I hate my life when I work a job. I hate every single job that I have. It's not, I cannot work a job. I'm also not employable because it's very hard for me not to talk back when someone tells me what to do, okay? So, I mean, think of it like you're gonna do or die as an entrepreneur. That's the mentality you have to have, okay? Now, there's something to be said about quitting if it's proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that you made the wrong decision in business. Like it was a smart thing for me to quit my online magazine because it was, it was, it was just a bad business to get into. But if you've, if you've chosen the right business, like I said, like you, you started the service business, you found something with high demand, right? Coaching, marketing, uh, all that stuff. You learned your skill, you mastered your skill, you learned how to sell, you're pounding the phone, you're pounding the emails, you're servicing the hell out of your clients, you're doing everything right, don't quit. Because it's gonna, it's for sure going to happen when you're doing all the right things and you're in the right business. The same thing with e-commerce. Okay, again, I, I don't suggest the e-commerce is your first business, but if you're doing the AliExpress, you're doing the Amazon FBA at least for the next three years, well, four years, where those things are probably still going to be relatively hot, or a drop shipping site. Okay, you can quit maybe on the first business when you realize it's gone to market and, and it didn't work, but you know, do the second one and the third one. Right? And then the third one, you're probably going to hit it and you're going to have a store that does three grand. You're going to learn, learn a lot more and you're probably going to be able to do another store that works without having to go through three failures. So that's very important is, is when you've got the right mentality, you start the right business. Do not fucking quit, dude. Ever, 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 ever. It, remember, it's just when I set the vision for this, I'm like, I'm doing this or I'm going to die trying. That's, that's how you have to think about it because what else are you going to do, man? Go work a fucking job. I'd rather die than that. So I might as well start a business and die trying to fucking make that happen. And when I did that, I was able to build this business and able to go to Asia and travel and 
do what I want and it's a beautiful thing and it, it just comes from not quitting. But I don't recommend a blog for the vast majority of you guys. I don't recommend self-improvement or personal development business for reasons we cover already. Next thing on how to handle obstacles is take uh, responsibility for your mistakes and learn from them. Okay, so Eric, Eric Reese in his uh, classic book on customer development says to treat failure as feedback, which I think is really good. I think he's right. Although at the time, failure will make you want to bang your head through a wall. Um, failure in business is like a divorce. It's painful. But looking back, uh, the most I've learned from entrepreneurship and basically the genesis of all this is from my mistakes. So really have to learn from those mistakes, but it's also just as important to take responsibility for them. This is crucial because as long as you blame someone else or something else, you won't be able to correct your mistakes in the future. And some people say that I have a big ego and, and they're right. Um, and I, I do want to be great and I do want to do all these great things. But on the other hand, I'm really, I feel like I'm really good at, at taking responsibility for everything in not just in business, but I'm in my life. Anything that goes wrong in my life, I say this is my my fault and my responsibility. Like, and then I ask myself, how could I have prevented that? And there's always an answer. There's always something that I could have done. Like when my site got hacked, I had pretty good. I thought I had pretty good security measures, but then when I went into it, I was like, well, I should have had security. I should have had white li li listed my IP. I should have had all these settings. I should have had all that. So I was pissed off for a second when my site got hacked, but then I was like, dude, this is your fault. Okay. You shouldn't have done that. You should have had this way prepared in advance. So let's let's create a new reality where this is gonna be, this is gonna never happen again and I'm gonna be super protected. Okay, and I, I can think of a million examples where that's happened and everything that goes wrong, I always take responsibility for that. And a lot of the time it's the hard thing to do. You wanna blame someone and you might blame someone at first, but then you, let's sit down, take a deep breath. I take full responsibility for that. And, you know, it's a tough pill to, to swallow. You know, no one likes to admit that they're wrong or that they made a mistake or that they failed. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, the, it's the man thing to do, okay? Take, you know, the man thing to do is take responsibility. The loser thing is to blame everyone else. When you take total responsibility, then you can create new outcomes in the future. When you don't take responsibility, you're never gonna be able to change and you're gonna keep making the same mistakes again. And that's a major thing that, is so important is, is don't make the same mistake twice, okay? In, instead of learning from that online magazine, my first one, that it wasn't the model, I went back and did it again with a fashion magazine, okay? So I, I'd given a year and a half to that Vice magazine clone, and then I gave another year to that online fashion magazine. I could have saved myself a year of time and investment if I just really sat down and said, you know, this is a mistake, I should learn from that instead of like, no, oh, dude, I'm great. I, I'm, I'm going to just power through it, man. I'm, I'm, I'm going to power through it and, you know, total, total wrong thing to do. And so that's something I'm very cognizant of. Fool me once, shame, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So really take responsibility from your mistakes and learn from them. And finally, the last point, okay, is don't fail. All right, I know I said f take failure as feedback, but... There's a lot of, uh, you know, as we cover already, failure feedback in hindsight, but ideally you don't want to fail at all, okay? Eric Ries, as I said in his book on groundbreaking book on customer development, super influenced the startup culture. So when I was in the startup accelerator, I heard a ton of guys talking about failing fast and pivoting and failure is feedback. And we're not trying to make money. We're just trying to learn. And then they pivot and... Um, not, we're not afraid to fail, and it was all like pro failure. And I was like, all those are useful concepts. I get it. I think failure is feedback is a great useful concept in hindsight. But moving forward, don't fucking fail, okay? Don't fail. Like, I was the guy who's like, no, I, I, I'm not in this for a learning experience. I'm, I'm in this to succeed. And, and I would argue with those other guys. I'm in this to succeed and to make money. And I will reluctantly accept failure. I will reluctantly accept it and reluctantly learn it as feedback, but I do not want to do it. I'm not in this to pivot. I'm not in this to iterate. I'm not in this to, um, you know, look at it as a learning experience. I'm in this to succeed. So you really have to have that mentality of I don't want to fail because failure costs you so much. 
as I said, in your first business, let's say it takes you a couple years of working some shit corporate job to save the money, build your exit plan, like I teach you how to do and how to sell. And you finally get out only to fail three months later because you picked the wrong business and you didn't work hard. Two years of saving is gone, dude. That's two years of your life gone. Now you're going to have to go back to the corporate world, save for another two years. So that's like four years gone. You know, X amount of money, all the opportunity cost of being able to invest that into a winning business, all the compound interest of the client that you got a year ago that could be paying you um, four years later, uh, all the opportunity cost of that client's lifespan over 10 years, and all the opportunity cost of compound reinvested marketing and advertising and reinvesting the profits into your business. Like failure is costly, dude. Not just financially, but mentally and psychically. And I feel like four businesses, the last couple of the, the e-commerce ones I didn't care about because I was just doing them on the side with RLD. But when I took those losses on, on those magazines, I was like, that fucked me up for weeks, dude. The, the, the one where my partner ransom stole my domain and tried to ransom it back to me, that, that fucked me up for like a month because not just was it a failure, but it was like a personal betrayal. So like, you have to have the mentality of like, I'm not going in this to fail. I'm not preparing to fail. I'm preparing to win at this, okay? Failure feedback, learning from your mistakes is good in hindsight, but the whole reason I did this series was so that you don't make the same mistakes that I did. I want you to get out there in your first business, or if you're already in the business right now, make sure it's the winner and not fail and have success right from day one, okay? I want you to have success right from day one and not make the same mistakes that I did. So again, it's about picking the right business, you know, where you know who has your money, there's a demand, clear, simple strategy to get revenue and keep it coming in. All the stuff that I covered in this series, which you can see at revolutionarylifestyledesign.com in the article notes. A lot of this is covered in my book, How to Sell. I, a lot of this is covered in my four part guide, which is free definitive guide to sales. Uh, also, if you, if you really do want to start the service business it's covered in my free article, how to start a service business. Um, and that's also available on YouTube for free. So the majority of the stuff that I've covered here, if you want to learn more about it, you can find it on my site for free or on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, Facebook, all up in your internet, dude. So I hope you found that useful. Um, let me know what you think in the comment section. And again, if you're just catching this in part two, please watch part one and check out the article where you can take the notes, save them to your Evernote for future reference. And as always, I wish you all the best in your personal development journey.